Data itself is neutral, but the analysis of data is not. Data is a very effective, for want of a better word, propaganda tool, political tool. There's the whole thing about if we leave the EU, then the GDP will be knocked down by 10% or, or 8%, depending on the certain figures and so forth. And again, you look at that and you say, well, it hasn't happened, but it was, it's very clear that essentially whoever put those numbers in and came up with those figures were using some very, very strong bias assumptions. You look at data and patterns emerge, trends emerge. What they have persuaded people is that they are very, looking at the data from a very scientific, technical standpoint, and therefore giving you a rational answer. Well, hello and welcome. I'm your host, Sam Knowles. And joining us today is Ian Whitaker, one of the leading financial and commercial analysts covering the media and advertising sector. He's the managing director and owner of Liberty Sky Advisors, has twice been City AM's Analyst of the Year, first in 2014 and again in 2019, and he writes regularly for both the media and financial press, for Campaign and for City AM. Ian helps marketers to speak the language of the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer, and is the go-to guy for understanding how the media, digital and marketing world is performing. Ian takes a no-nonsense approach to explaining how the media category makes its money, and the sector that's often very much at home to spin and storytelling takes an evidence-based, data-driven approach to cutting through the hype and telling it how it is. This means he's particularly good at understanding which innovation is a shiny new toy and which has the potential to revolutionise the world of media and marketing. Ian's worked for NM Rothschild, Merrill Lynch, RBS, UBS, and spent a dozen years as Head of Media and Digital Equity Research at Libra. We've known each other for many years, and I've always been impressed by Ian's data storytelling skills. Ian, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Welcome to Data Malarkey. Thank you very much, Sam. With an introduction like that, what more, what more can I say? That's very, very kind. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on here. Now, I trust that is a decent summary of who you are and what you've done <laughs> and what you do today. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Anything that I've got wrong? No, I, I don't think there's anything you, you've got wrong from there. I mean, it may be worthwhile me just saying uh, a few words about what I do now. So, as you said, I'm managing director of Liberty Sky Advisors. I decided just to set up my own uh, several years back. And so I offer advisory consultancy services. I speak at events. I run a subscription service, which is called The Bigger Picture. And also as well, uh, I also offer training around how to speak the language of the CFO, uh, whether bespoke courses or, or more general uh, courses as well. So uh, I think that in a summary is is, is it. But I, um, yeah, no, it's great to be on here. So thanks very much. Very good. Now, listen, before we get down and dirty with data, and, and uh, I'm sure you and I could wig out on data uh, and numbers, uh, particularly financial data, uh, all morning. But before we get down and dirty with data, I want to go beyond the CV. And I want to start with a question that's designed to get to the heart of you. And it doesn't necessarily ask you to tell us about your day job. So tell me, Ian, how do you spend your time? That's a very, that's a very good question. Um, I, I got, I'm going to keep it limited to the work time. Shall we say? I think I, um, I, you don't want to hear about all the other stuff. But what what would say is the the bedrock of, of how I see things anyway is I need to know what's going on, and so essentially, sort of of the way that I approach things is most of the day I will spend actually in research, background information, because. And it's not just on what's happening in the media tech. So, for example, maybe going through annual reports, maybe going through companies' latest results, but it'd be also happening as well. So, that it, in terms of what's happening in other industries, what's happening on the macro side, what's happening on the geopolitical side. My subscription product is called The Bigger Picture. The reason why I called it that was because, for what I try to point out, and it's also what I also try to point out in the training course is that you can't just look if you're in the media and tech industries, and particularly if you're in advertising, at just your own space. Because what happens is, what happens higher up the stream, and I won't use profanities on the show, but I think there's a, a, a well-known phrase that things trickle down. And so if you don't understand what's happening at the higher level in terms of the bigger drivers, it's very easy so, to get blindsided by what comes after. And to give you a classic example of this, if you look, for example, in the first half of 2022, we're all talking about how 
tech firms were, were going to revolutionize the world. So many startups in so many different areas, food delivery, yeah, car, sales of cars, etc. What killed those models was the rise, rapid rise in US interest rates from the first half of 2022, because what had been effectively a zero rate interest environment where people could borrow for free and just go for growth suddenly changed into an environment where, first of all, the cost of capital became more expensive. And then second of all, for reasons that we don't necessarily need to get into now, but people can, can get in touch with me if they, if they want, is that the rise in interest rates impacted very significantly the future valuations of many of those companies. Now, if you didn't have a handle on what was happening with interest rates and how that could impact into, into tech, you may turn around and say, well, hold on a minute. Why is it that suddenly these business models have gone from being heroes to zeros in the matter of a couple of months? And yet, if you understood the dynamics sort of, of, of what was happening on the macro side, you would see that why that was the case. So to, to circle back, as it were, to your original question, yep. there is, there's never going to be a way that can capture all the information that is out there in the world. But one of the good things being an analyst, and also as well, my background, I was a historian, that's what I trained with, is you realise there's a huge amount of material out there, but what you very quickly sort of realise is what are the key sources that you go to? What are the key sources of data? How do you interpret that data? And what do you use that data for? And I'd end on one point, and I think this will probably feed into a number of other questions as well. They say that de data is the is the new fuel, new oil, and I'd agree that's correct. But it's worthwhile pointing out that oil by itself actually does nothing. What it has to be used for is a purpose; it needs to be refined. But also, as well, its value comes from actually what it's used for. And it's the same when it comes to data as well. Very good. I like that very much. You 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 hinted at the uh, at, at, at being a historian. I know you. I know you have current endeavours in uh, in history. Maybe maybe we'll come back to that. Um, so no, I, I I like that very very much. Um, about about uh, oil by itself uh, does nothing. Data by itself uh, is useless. Um, and I, I particularly like your your talking about those key sources being able for you to 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 sort the wheat from the chaff to get the signal from the noise. Tell us then. So in your in your your sort of days spent full of um, research and and finding the, um, the, the 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 data that matter. What role does data, particularly financial data, play in the work that you do? Oh, it, it, it's crucial. I'd say it's the, it's the bedrock for for what I do. Yeah, and again, this is where I think let, let's let's circle back to the point about the, the the sort of history and the training there. When you work as a historian, so what you realise is the data is there to is used to support your crucial point. So what you do is you go through the data, you analyse it, and you come up with a summary. Now, in reality, what happens is, yeah, people will have a they'll have a certain view going into, da into data, and it may be, and this is where the whole thing is about bias, unconscious bias comes in. And whereas an analyst, you have to be very careful that what you do is that you don't try and fit the data into a preordained view, but actually look at the data and say, okay, does this back up what I say? Does it mean that essentially what I said was wrong? Is there a gray zone there for that? But the data itself is very, very important because what it does is, and then again, it comes back to this fuel argument. Yeah, there is your energy, your resources to come up with the point of view that you want to get across. And one of the things that that I, I like as an analyst, whether it was working in the financial markets as an equities analyst or, or what I do now, is that, and this will seem a very, very strange phrase, but maybe, maybe you can uh, sort of understand this as well, that the data talks to you. That the data sends sends a signal. That, that, that there is, you look at data and patterns emerge, trends emerge. You know, whether that's over the long term, whether it's over the short term, there are ideas that are generated from that data that maybe are not the most obvious ones at first. But when you delve down into them and you dig down and you sort of uh, take it off on a different level, you realise that actually there's findings that you never would have thought about before, but are actually extremely valuable. 
one thing. So my standpoint is it's absolutely critical to do that. And again, if you want to put it, there is the extraction. You find the data. Yeah, I'm going to use the all, all analogy here. You, you, go, you, you actually extract it. Then to use the refinery, to refine it, you analyze it. Yeah, and then you sort of refine it into a core product, which is your analysis or, on things and your, your conclusions. And so, yeah, there are several stages when it comes through the whole data process. And I think, yeah, one thing I would say, and, and, and maybe this is wrong, maybe it's, you know, maybe I'm making a sweeping, sweeping statement that is not justified, is that I think the problem with a lot of data is that people see data by itself as good. Yeah, one of the things that, and I've written before on this in terms of uh, of articles and campaign and and other publications, is that typically sort of when when you get the whole sort of debates around models, and we won't get into the politics of things because this could be sort of of done for for so many different areas, but what most people tend to concentrate on is the output. They'll take a they'll they'll take a, a view of a model and they'll say, well, this model is telling us this. This was the output it produced. And therefore, yeah, this must be the answer. Well, actually, anyone who is, who is so heavily involved in modeling would tell that the output is actually the least important part of it. When I was a financial analyst and I'd go in to see clients, they might reference the output, but what they were really, really interested in was the inputs. What they were really interested in was essentially the assumptions that you had made in order to come to that conclusion. And it's worthwhile pointing out, and again, this is where it comes to the whole sort of, you can make the analogy with the all part, is that data is not, yeah, data itself is neutral, but the analysis of data is not. What it reflects is the unconscious biases of the person who is doing that. And that is why, for example, in the financial stock markets, you can have the same stock with the same data, because bear in mind that for, if you are covering a company as an analyst, companies are legally obliged to give both the same information and also as well the same guidance to everyone in the market. So they can't selectively disclose information. So everyone will have access to the same the, the same amount of data as their peers. And yet, if you had 25 different analysts covering a stock, you'd have 25 different set of forecasts that are out there. And that simply reflects the fact that each person will come into that data and analyze it in a different way. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the um, that classic quote from the great British statistician George Box in the 70s that you know all models are wrong and uh, but some are, some are useful. Um, uh, and also don't think don't think that on a um, on a uh, on a podcast called Data Malarkey that um, you're going to sound weird saying the data talks to you. <laughs> I know very 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 well what you mean. Absolutely. I was I, I, I was actually I was actually doing a piece of data analysis uh, in the healthcare space at the beginning of the year. Um, and I, it was a, it was a huge, it was, a, it was a big data set. It was a big, big data set. Um, and I got a sort of, I mean, you'll understand this here, and we can geek out on this. Um, I, I, I opened the spreadsheet and I saw the thirty-six thousand lines, and I can't even remember how wide it was, but, but open up, and I got this sort of free song, this feeling of, you know, there's a story in here, and I need, I need to find it. But, but I, I like also, I, I very much respect your, uh, your, your point when you say that the data is neutral and that you're a hypothesis tester rather than a hypothesis prove, prover. You're not trying to fit a story to the data. You're trying to determine uh, what that means. I wonder if we could. I, 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 know, I know you look at you look at, at, at macro um, uh, and trends and other industries as well, but I know also you look at particularly at media and marketing businesses. Maybe when if we think about when you're assessing the financial performance and the potential, let's say of an advertising agency holding company, what sort of key performance indicators are you looking for? How can you assess if you've got a turkey or a unicorn on your hands? <laughs> no, no, that, that that's a really good question. So. Again, if maybe step it back and look at what the role of an equity analyst is, and therefore, sort of also as well touches on what I do now. When you're an equity analyst, I mean, what, what your valuation is about, you're essentially trying to tell investors should you buy or sell the shares. If you're doing that, what you really need to do is you're taking a forward view of the company rather than a historic view. 
what has gone in the past is definitely useful. And you need to know where a company has come from in order to really understand where it is now and what it may do in the future. But what's really critical if you're you're thinking about it from a, is this a turkey or is it a unicorn, is what are the future growth projections from here on in? And if you look at things, you know, there's a variety of different things that would look at. Yeah, It's a case of what do you think about the wider industry? For, let's take the agencies. What are the main drivers of, of, of agency performance now? What's going to happen, for example, with AI? I know it's a big topic, and quite frankly, I think yeah, some of, some of what we're hearing at the moment, it'd be interesting to see whether it comes out, but I think obviously it will have implications. But what about their media businesses moving forward? If you go down each of their lines of businesses, how do these look in terms of future growth prospects and so forth? So you come to a, you come to a view of the industry. You then come to view of the different competitors, what they're doing differently, what they're doing the same, who seems to have the best performance. Then you drill down into the individual names and you look again at what each of them are doing. And also as well, what you then take into account, it's not just the operational performance as well. You can have a company, although this is, you don't tend to get these too often. You can have a company that is doing fantastically well when it comes to operational performance. But you look at its balance sheet and you look at the amount of debt it's got and the leverage and how much it's burning through cash, your your, your eyes water with things. Because yeah, if you take a step back, what really sort of we're telling about a company is, is whether whether you should buy or, or sell sell a company. This is a, an, as an equities analyst. Whether you should buy or sell the shares. You can have a good company, a company that's very good operationally, but it might not be a great company for a shareholder because it may not give them the returns that they need. So you've got to bear that sort of, of endpoint in mind. But anyways, say you look at the wider industry, you look at that and you do a peer analysis, you look at the individual companies and you look at them across all aspects. Yeah, how they're doing operational performance, what is their financial strength, what are their future prospects. You also look at the management teams. Yeah, there, there was a, a, a quote that I always remember from a early days as an analyst it is... Yeah, and I, I, somebody famous said this, but I can't remember who, who who said it. Definitely not me. I didn't originate the phrase. I could tell you that now. But when when, when good companies meet bad managements, bad managements win. And that's usually the case. So you need to take a view on what the quality of the management is also at those respective institutions as well. And then also as well, what you do is you, you again, you take a wider view. We'll go back to what we're saying about tech before. You, you can have a, a, a business that satisfies all the pluses when it comes to strategic long-term growth. This should be, you know, this company looks to be a leader, good management team. But if, let's say, we expect a, a environment of elevated interest rate rises for the next few years, that's going to have an impact on the valuation. And again, I come back to this point, and I think it also as well ties in with, with, with data I say that what you have to look is what exactly is the end goal here and when you're looking at the analysis. If it's an equities analyst, what you're looking at is, does this provide value to shareholders? So in the example that just used, say you can have a good company, but if you're thinking the interest rate environment is going to be high and that will impact tech valuations, that's going to have a view, an impact on whether that should be a good holding for somebody to have, whether they should actually buy that, those shares. And I think it's also the case with, with data as well. One question that people need to ask when they're, so when they're looking at data, when they're analyzing data is, what exactly is this for? What is your end goal from this? Because if you don't know what your end goal is from this, then I think you end up, and this is, I suspect that this may take us down another line of, of, of questioning, but if you, you end up in potentially going down the quantitative fallacy or what's called the McNamara fallacy, and to go back to what you said about history before, I'm doing a history of war degree at the moment, um, sort of, of part-time. One of the courses were on the Vietnam War, and there's a very famous uh, yeah, example of where the Americans really messed it up with their strategy was that their strategy for several years was driven by what they called the body count that when they went for, they judged their success in quantitative measures. How many people are, are, 
the how many soldiers, enemy soldiers they killed, how many enemy they captured, and so forth. And of course, what that led to was skewed incentives, also as well misaligned the strategy with what was going on on the ground, and gave a false picture to the people who were making the decisions. And so I think that's an absolutely critical part. Sort of when you look at, at data, you have to realize, and again, it all it all comes back to this central point. Data by itself, it is extremely valuable, but it has no point in itself. There needs to be a purpose for it. And also as well, it needs to be analyzed and it needs to be refined. When you're when you're looking, I mean, I, I know you obviously you're not just looking at uh, the advertising world, you're looking at media, you're looking at uh, broadcasters and so on and so forth. Maybe thinking about looking at the some of the, the big digital platforms um, that are all entirely driven by advertising revenue. I mean, I, I know they do consultancy and other things as well, but but you know the the, the Googles and the Facebooks in particular of this uh, of this world, uh, maybe not so much the Twitter X's of this world anymore. Um, but when you're looking at the big digital platforms, clearly you're looking at quality of leadership. Uh, you're looking at structure. You're looking at uh, you're looking at what's happened in the past as well as future growth potential. Is there anything specific and different that you would look at? Any other metrics? Uh, or any other way of looking at the data for the for, for the for these enormous platforms uh, that to in your analysis. Well, let, let me give you an interesting example of that. It's something I've highlighted a number of times uh, over the past few months. You look at Meta. Meta has been an absolutely stellar stock market performer in twenty twenty three and going into twenty twenty four. And if you look at its several quarters of financial results, uh, her significantly beat expectations. If you go down and delve into their financial documentation, what you'll see sort of very interesting trend is that if you look at the growth that's coming from their core North American advertisers, it's probably around between a third to a half the growth rate of what the company's overall growth rate is. In fact, for the first nine months of 2023, the revenues that came in from North American advertisers as opposed to revenues generated in North America, and there's a crucial distinction there, the revenues for those North American advertisers only grew 2.3%. The revenues for their Asia-Pacific customers grew over 25%. And if you look in Q3, it was something like mid-40s growth from those asia pac customers. Now, what did that tell you? Well, what that told you was that essentially a lot of Facebook's outperformance in 2023 wasn't because there was a huge range of customers who said, we're now going to go back to Facebook. This is a great platform. There's suddenly all the corporates who decided to spend on there. It wasn't even as though it was fueled by traditional SME growth. What actually it was fueled by was two particular Chinese retailers, Xin and Temu, spending like crazy to expand it in North American and Western European markets. And then also as well, Chinese, particularly Chinese online gaming companies, also aggressively spending it in in overseas markets. So what you have is that you have, as it were, a very lopsided contribution to growth. Now, what assumptions or, or what assumptions can you therefore make from that? Well, the obvious one is that growth is fueling, is being fueled by Chinese companies and, and so forth. Okay, right. What's the implication of that? Those companies are, have decided to export their way out of, of the Chinese market. That makes sense, given what's happening in China at the moment. So it may give an indication of, of their views of the long-term health of the Chinese consumer, the potential boom for growth within that market as well. But another assumption would be to make, okay, that if you look at where Meta's growth is coming from, it is resting on fairly narrow, narrow pillars. And what happens if, for example, the growth slows down? Or and this is where, yeah, I'm going to throw in here a not necessarily a data point, but where thinking about sort of bigger ideas come from, where those businesses are impacted by, by obscure changes. There's a debate going on at the moment in the US, for example. Do they need to change the amount or, or the level at which goods are allowed into the US? without customs checks. Now, that may seem like a very arcane rule, but if that does come through and it's massively lowered, 
that massively changes the dynamics for something like Ashina or Temu in that market, and that potentially then can flow down into what's happening in terms of, of Meta's advertising revenues. So, yeah, again, there's an example when you look at these companies where you think, okay, this is something that is not necessarily the headline number that people would love. But if you look at essentially when you dig down and you pick up some of the interesting facts, there's a number of extrapolations that you can make from it. And you can test those assumptions. This, this is not to say that all these assumptions will be right. But it will be to say that it does open up interesting lines of inquiry. I, I think that's I think it's particularly interesting. Uh, I had absolutely no idea about that kind of mid forty percent Q three meta meta growth, and uh, until um, uh, you know you talk about that. But I, I think that's interesting from two points of view. One is that that. Um, you know, traditionally these platforms, you know, in in North America and and in other Western markets, have grown through SMEs, right? They're, they're, they're funded by mom and pop advertisers. I'm, I'm, it's what sixty, seventy percent of Google and, and Meta's advertising historically comes from, rather than from global multinationals, comes from small people. But but that, that's and, and that gives them a kind of a, bow, a, a what what we might call a diamond relationship rather than the bow tie relationship. But if you have that bow tie relationship between Meta's growth being driven by by two or three Chinese gambling companies. At time of recording, I've just come back from a fascinating week in China, not working in media, but 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 working with clients over there, um, and have experienced the Western frustration of not being able to access Google or Netflix or LinkedIn or any of the other things I would ordinarily do because of the incredible. Uh, my VPN that works in any country doesn't work uh, in Shanghai. Um, uh, the Chinese government knows absolutely everything I was trying to access quite clearly. Um, uh, but um, it's so interesting to hear that it's based on two Chinese gaming companies. I mean, not entirely, but, but a big portion of it is. The Chinese government could decide that that was not something that didn't want to happen. And that could have a kind of cataclysmic effect on the on the growth potential of Facebook. I think that's so interesting that that, that you're going back into kind of macroeconomic factors, but also digging so deep in the data gets you to that intelligence. I just want to look. I just want to ask you about one other area because uh, th- thinking about broad. Um, it's maybe it's the wrong the, the wrong uh, entertainment platforms. Let's think about Netflix and Amazon Prime and Disney Plus as a as a, a as a as a group. I know there are others, Hulu and so on. Um, traditionally, particularly when they weren't carrying advertising uh, or they were they didn't have a part advertiser funded model, they were incredibly data reclusive. They didn't want you to know anything about their viewership. They they wouldn't give their data away. Um, how are you able to for such Big businesses that are so shy or or uh, um, uh, kind of covering up on the the key data points that would matter, you know, compared to a commercial broadcast like ITV or Channel Four, say, how how are you able to to, to get kind of a sense of valuation for them when they hide so much data that would be useful to you? Well, <laughs> to be fair, in that case, it, it, it it's generally quite it's simple, and we'll 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 come back to that in a moment. I think if you you know, there's, there's two things that would say that there's a, from an overall valuation perspective and from an advertising perspective as well. And I think on the advertising perspective, yeah, handle that one first. That the lack of data is more of an issue, quite frankly, for people who are trying to sell advertising than necessarily somebody at, at my level. You, you, what, what do I mean by that is if I'm looking at an analyst, what I'm thinking about is, okay, how much share can Netflix capture at the overall advertising market? And what th- this is one of the problems that, for example, I have with people looking at cost per thousand metrics and saying that our cost per thousand metric is this, and therefore if we get this amount of impressions or this amount, blah, 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 yet we will generate this amount of revenues. What that implicitly assumes is that there is unlimited pot of money out there i.e. that essentially all you do is that you build up, you can build up your impressions to a certain amount, you know, to a infinitesimal amount, and you will still get the same amount of money because you're charging this particular CPM rate. When it comes to to something like advertising, that's not the case. You know, there is a limited pot of money. And so when you look at what those services are offering, you do have to think about what they are getting in terms of TV viewing share, and you get indications of that, what's coming through from, from Nielsen and other sources of data, Barb, et cetera. Uh, on that, you then take a view of whether their offering is seen as premium, whether it's seen as uh, as offering mass market, what the other players are going to do as well. 
within there and where that money is going to come from. Is it just going to come from a linear TV market or does it come increasingly, as people are talking about, from a, a video market? But being blunt, on the advertising side, the lack of data, it's interesting if you could find out that data. But quite frankly, it doesn't really impact the overall viewer of how that advertising offering will work, except at the margins. And that's the same when it comes to the valuation of, of, of those streamers as well. I mean, my view is I've been negative on, on the streaming industry for several years now. And, and it really comes down to a very simple proposition that essentially the growth, the growth that is needed to justify the valuations and the return of capital on the investments that they've made, it's just not out there. I think what happened with those companies as a sideline is the executives in those companies, what they really looked at was they, they viewed the rest of the world as the same same way as the North American market um, uh, uh, and took a view that consumers throughout the world would act in the same way as North American consumers, and that wasn't the case. But there's a very simple proposition for those services, and it's very much like the old pay TV models. It is, it is number of subscribers times your average revenue per user. And as you've seen, and the reason why you've seen prices go up by so much it's because everyone was focusing on for so long on the left-hand side of that equation on the subscriber growth. And as that started to slow down in order to get the revenue growth they needed, what they need to focus on was the right-hand side of the equation, which is the average revenue per user. And so this is when you look at the data, you, you take a point of view and you say, okay, this is what the, the growth projections would be, but how many households are there actually out there here in the world? How many would like to take this service? How many can? Just given the the streaming, I mean, there's something. I think I think the figure is what is it? It's around eight percent. I think yeah, off the top of my head, the U.S. population doesn't have access to broadband yet in very rural areas still. So you've still got a significant chunk, even in Western markets, that can't necessarily take the services. Never mind what's going on throughout the rest of the world as well. And then of course you have propensity to pay. Yeah, again, what people pay in the states, where they're used to paying a hundred dollars plus for a pay TV service. Sure, you know, the states and, and Western Europe, if you were to look on a per income level, consumers are, are, are generally the same. But if you look at their propensity to pay for pay TV services, it, it's vastly different and so forth. And so, you know, again, on a point like that with the entertainment companies, you don't really need to use the data in order to, in order to actually take a, a, a sort of, you have to apply common sense as well. And this is where, again, yeah, and sorry to, to keep reiterating this point, but this is where, again, I think it comes back to the, the, the whole argument that data by itself, yet yeah, is not valuable. It needs that refinement. It needs that analysis. It needs those conclusions. And I think if I hear so much of, and I think this is where, for example, the advertising industries have very much been captured by the whole data argument, is... If I hear so many sort of uh, many of the arguments that I hear when it comes to around data and how it should be used and measurements and what people are looking for, remind me of when I used to, to study the history of Reformation Europe and you'd have religious debates about how many angels you can dance on a pinhead. And it, it, it gets down to a level where it becomes very theoretical rather than having practical implications. Now, there's another aspect to this uh, uh, as well, is that, and again, yeah, it's a slightly different angle, but data is data is a very effective, for want of a better word, propaganda tool, political tool. Because people see it as neutral, because people see it as scientific, yeah, what they tend to do is they tend, most people tend to trust it. And I think this is one of the reasons, for example, why you take it off on a slightly different sort of level. Companies like Google and Facebook have been so successful at capturing advertising money, their massive share of advertising money in the market, because what they have persuaded people is that they are very looking at the data from a very scientific, technical standpoint, and therefore giving you a rational answer. And it almost becomes like a two plus two equals four sort of calculation. And in doing so, what they've done is they've sort of pushed aside the traditional way of looking at advertising, which is seen as a bit more sort of soft and fluffy and not really fitting in with what should be now the new era 
of, of quantitative data-driven analysis. So I think when it when sort of, of looking at these things, I think when it comes to data, data needs to be married with that common sense. You, you need, and, and again, I know it's going to bore people. I know they'll be like, God, not the same point over and over again. You can't just look at data by itself. You've got to put it in a wider framework. Co co completely agree, and actually, that leads very nicely to where I wanted to take us. Just to, as we, as we, as we not wind down, but just as as we kind of move through, I want to think about communication. And I know you believe that. I think I'm right in saying that you believe that one one uh, of the reason that many who work in marketing don't get the time or respect that they that they deserve or need from finance directors and from the board is that they don't speak the language of the chief financial officer. They're not, they, 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 parlez-vous CFO? I don't. I'm afraid they don't. Um, but without giving away your special source and without giving away your entire training program, can you give our listeners and viewers a taste of what it means to do precisely that, to speak the language of the CFO? I mean, I, I think you, you've been doing that throughout our conversation, but can you give us some specifics about how marketers could really benefit from speaking this this dialect of business ease, which is the language of the CFO. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a very nice plug for the training course. So thanks very much, Sam. Um, um, and of course, anyone wants to get in contact, please do. Um, I think I think what it what it really comes down to is you know, what I always say is if you're trying to and, and for advertising, if you think about it for advertisers, people in marketing. It's what you would do with a consumer. If you try and sell a product, you've got to understand the consumer. And it's the same sort of thing. And that, that's really the, the, the simple point here, is that when it comes to trying to persuade the CFO, a CEO, and a board, that essentially more should be spent on, on advertising and marketing, what you need to think about is, okay, what are going to be the arguments that persuade them that this is a good investment to make? Yeah, and it is an investment and not a cost. And so what I say is, look, you know, you've got to you've got to work out what their priorities are. You've got to find exactly what, so as it were, ticks their boxes, what they're looking for, and then you take what you do, and then you say this is where you can help. Now, I do think one of the things I have been saying uh, and drilling into a lot, and again, people will say not again, but but I think it's an important point. The past two years have been a vast unplanned experiment in showing how advertising and marketing plays a direct role in companies' bottom and top line performance. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at the amount of price increases that companies have had to pass through, particularly consumer goods companies, over the past two years to consumers, at the start of the period, they would have looked at the scale of price increases and said, there's absolutely no way we're going to be able to put that through without our volumes being absolutely decimated. And yet they did. And if you listen to what the companies themselves say on their calls, the number one, by far, the number one answer that comes back, and I would say a vast majority of these companies, is they say it's the strength of their brands that has enabled them to drive through their price increases. And if you are somebody in marketing who wants to persuade your, your CFO, CEO to spend more on advertising and marketing, that sort of, of information should be absolute gold dust. Very good. Very good. Uh, I, think, I think that's very interesting. And, and, I, and, and you, you, didn't, you, didn't use, you didn't use the terms, but I've heard you talk many times about when, when you said, when you said um, thinking of advertising uh, as an expenditure rather than as a, as a cost, you're talking about it as being capex, not opex, right? Is that mm -hmm. is that is that the right? Exactly. The way I describe it is, I say that advertising and marketing are, are intangible capex. Is intangible capex that just as firms spend on physical plant to grow their businesses, they need to spend on advertising and marketing to also do the same as well. And that has implications. You need to maintain it. You need to make sure that you don't go down the cheapest route. 
Absolutely, absolutely. The the, the de- delving into that and that cheap long tail. Now, listen, we're we're interested uh, here at Data Malarkey in uh, the good and the bad. Uh, and I wondered if if uh, as we draw towards the close, you could give give me the worst example of the misuse of data that you've ever observed. Now, that can be in your career, more broadly in the public domain. I mean. Um, uh, uh, I mean, is it about companies being cavalier about when they report their revenue figures? I'm just thinking examples of or the, the most glaring examples of a misuse of data in financial reporting, maybe particularly in media companies. Oh, well done. I'm trying to get myself, I, I, I'm sort of trying to get myself, uh, uh, not get myself into trouble here. But, but actually, I'll tell you what, I'm going to use up both sides of the argument here, right? I'm going to go back to Brexit. I know, controversial topic for, for many people. And often talked about on this show, often, often talked right? about here. And so if you want to look at a, a misuse of data on the, the pro-Brexit side, yeah, it's the £400 million pounds, you know, for the NHS on the side of a bus, which, which essentially is would have been factoring in existing increases that were going through to the NHS as budget, would have included that. You would have been essentially no, absolutely no rationale of how that was done by, how it was explained by. And when you listen to the explanations that were given, it was clear that it was a bunch of, hell, you can all put your words in there. But on the Remain side of things, there was the whole thing about if we leave the EU, then the GDP will be knocked down by 10% or, or 8%, depending on the certain figures and so forth. And again, you look at that and you say, well, it hasn't happened, but it, it was it's very clear that essentially whoever put those numbers in and came up with those figures were using some very, very strong bias assumptions on there. And the, again, it, it sort of goes back goes back to this point before that this is why I would say to people, don't when you look at a model and you you see an output, don't trust the output. You need to know what are the assumptions that have been made behind it. This is why I have so many part the yeah again it, it's a it's a slightly controversial point but this is why for example you know, I had so many problems with with some of the events of the past couple of years where figures are thrown out there saying there'll be x amount of deaths or x amount of or gdp hits or x amount of this is you just don't know what the underlying assumptions are that's been put into these spreadsheets and these models and so if you don't understand what's the underlying assumptions, it's very, very hard to take a point of view on whether they're credible or not. And so what I would say to people is when you see there's a phrase that Ronald Reagan used in the 1980s when he was talking about the Soviet Union and the whole idea about nuclear disarmament talks. And he said his attitude was trust but verify. And I think that's actually a very good approach to take when you see that people come out with figures. You don't trust them 100%. You say, okay, my base case is that you're coming at this from good intentions, but I need to check and I need to verify that what you've done, that I'm comfortable with that. Very good. Uh, excellent. Uh, th- this is the, the tale of my cat, Quincy, who often makes an appearance during the podcast. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, Good for Quincy. Uh, um, we had a uh, a recent guest on the show was Andrew Cooper, Lord Cooper of Windrush, the founder of Populous, uh, now Yonder Consulting, who was Cameron's strategy strategy guy in Number Ten for a few years. Um, and he made the, the, he made the, the point in a slightly different number, but about the Remain side, he talked about the three hundred and fifty million as well, obviously, uh, and and quite how um, that was a Dominic a Dominic Cummings trap that Remain fell into, and it was repeated ad nauseam uh, as the one defining statistic. Um, the number he gave was that was that the, o- o- Osborne as Chancellor commissioned the Treasury to work out what the um, typical household. Um, uh, hit was going to be, uh, and it was going to be five thousand pounds a household, and that was just kind of that was that was an incredible figure. It just it, it was too easy to, to to pick it apart. So I'm I, it's it's always good to go back to Brexit. Um, always happy to have uh, mention of that. Now, listen, I have a I have a um uh, a, a, and finally Columbo question uh, for you. Um, is that is there anything in the way that you work with data that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Oh, that's a, that's. A- uh, that's a good question. Um, 
I don't think so. I think we've covered all topics. I do want to come back, though, to what you just said on the Lord Cooper interview. And I think this is this is one of my points that I would say. When I think you get those sorts of, let's say, figures that are thrown out there for public debate, I think one of the things that is critically important is that you get when it comes to producing those forecasts, because they are going to be given, they are, they are, they are very powerful tools and weapons that can be used by either side in the debate. I think the absolutely critical thing is to make sure that the balance of the people, that you have the right balance of people who are contributing to those forecasts. And again, this is where it comes back to this whole point of unconscious bias. Or indeed, it could be conscious bias, quite frankly. But what you get is you can see a prime example there where, you know, it's not hard to imagine the Treasury orthodoxy looking at things in a certain way and therefore coming up with a certain calculation. Now, that's fine if the explicit assumption is you, you want to use that as a political weapon to make a point. But if actually what you're trying to do is make something that hopefully you inform the wider population then I think what you need is you need correcting balances on the other side to make sure that that those sorts of excesses get checked. I think um, one of the one of the um, uh, I, I, I mentioned signal and noise. One one of the the great quotes in that Nate Silver book, Signal and the Noise, um, uh, particularly in the wake of uh, of the, of Google flu trends, when every everybody thought that Google search was going to tell us everything in the world, and it turned out that the, the biggest single predictor of of influenza in the United States was college basketball because they happened to happen at the same time. Um, but that Silver said, um, the data don't speak for themselves. We speak for them. We imbue them with meaning. I think you have lived and breathed that through every moment of this podcast uh, and through your <laughs> practice. So thank you for that. Um, tell us, Ian, where can our listeners, our viewers, find out about you and what you're up to online and in social media? Well, I post a lot on LinkedIn. So please, if you want to, you can you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll probably, I mean, I, I, I can make this as a unique announcement now. I'll probably be moving slightly away from publishing uh, so much on LinkedIn. Um, so I do have a subscription service as well, as I mentioned, the bigger picture that looks at uh, what's happening, as I said, marries what's happening in media and tech, the trends there, but also as well tries to put it in a holistic worldview as well uh, as what's going on there. So please, people can either subscribe, yeah, or, and I get it, yeah, cost of living crisis, et cetera, if they don't necessarily want to, to pay. I do do a newsletter that just picks up all, all my LinkedIn posts that have done during the week as well. Um, best way, they said, search for me on, on LinkedIn, or if you type in Ian Whitaker Media, and it'll come up with my website as well, and, and all my details are on there. Thank you so much for your time, Ian, for sharing your approach to using Data Smarter. I think it's very fair to say that if there are more people with your pragmatic, evidence-based, bigger picture view, there'd be rather less malarkey in the world of media, <laughs> and rather more data rather more data-driven common sense. Ian Whitaker, Liberty Sky Advisors, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sam Nelt. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Data Malarkey. To find out what kind of data storyteller you are, why not take our data storytelling scorecard? It takes just two minutes to complete and we'll give you a personalized report right away. Visit data-storytelling.scoreapp.com or follow the link in the show notes.